Why was Rommel's 7th Panzer Division called Gespenster Division Ghost Division? From all we know, it earned its name during the Battle of France. Rommel led his 7th Panzer Division in such a way that it made a Division Fantôme not only for the French side but also for his own superiors. So the question is, what did Rommel do to earn this name for his division? Well, it comes down to the actions of the 16th and 17th of May 1940. Rommel's breakthrough at Avenes. And as so often with Rommel, the situation or better any proper interpretation is quite complicated. So at first we take a look at the situation and then put it into perspective. The whole incident starts basically with an order to not advance any further. Since the consensus among Rommel's superiors was that the extended parts of the Maginot line should be penetrated by the infantry and that the panzers should be preserved for future operations. As such, the 4th Army released an order in the morning of the 16th of May that the French fortification lines should not be crossed. Although during the day the situation changed and in the early afternoon the directive was given to advance, yet this was not in written order from the Corps, which would have included restrictions as well. This order actually arrived too late. This should have serious consequences, because at that time Rommel had already disappeared with the tanks. So let's look at Rommel's advance. At around 1800 hours, Rommel started the advance and soon spotted the outlines of the extended parts of the Maginot line. Pillboxes, turrets and various barricades. Now Rommel during the first world war was a successful infantry commander that often used surprise attacks for great effect. Yet now he was moving with panzers without air support against a fortified position. Nevertheless, he assaulted the position with his panzers, although the French initially were surprised they soon fought back fiercely. Several panzers were lost to the anti-tank gun fire, yet ultimately the panzers with the help of motorcycle troops, Kratschützen and combat engineers managed to break into the French lines and disable French pillboxes with direct fire, flamethrowers and satchel charges. Additionally, artillery support suppressed the other parts of the French defense. For a textbook example on how to attack fortifications with tanks, see this video on offensive panzer tactics. After a way was breached, the panzers advanced into the defensive line, firing to both sides during the move, which should usually be avoided according to the German field manuals. A few hours later, at 2300, a second defensive line was penetrated, and the panzers had broken through the French lines and were facing a French artillery position, which they charged while firing on the move. Now Rommel continued to advance towards Avenes along the road. Here the 5th French Motorized Infantry Division had established a camp for the night. The panzers raced through this formation and fired towards both sides, thus completely overwhelming the French unit. Additionally, parts of the 18th Infantry Division and the 1st Armored Divisions were hit as well. Never again in this campaign did such apocalyptic scenes occur as in the night of the 16th to 17th of May, on the road from Solera Chateau to Avenes. The 5th Motorized Infantry Division was literally rolled over during the sleep. Even German soldiers whose units followed this road a few hours later in daylight were stunned. Around midnight Rommel reached Avenes. The German troops passed through and took position west of it in the hills. Yet due to the hasty advance some units lost contact. As such Rommel waited for the other units of his regiment to catch up. Meanwhile one of the trailing panzer battalions was attacked by the remnants of the 1st French Armored Division. This resulted in delays and German losses. The French formation was also equipped with Char B1, which were almost invincible to German guns with the exception of artillery and heavy flak guns like the 88mm, which wasn't particularly mobile. To deal with the threat, Rommel sent back some of his tanks that managed to detract some of the Char Bs. At around 0400, the French retreated with only a handful of tanks left. Now a short recap, at around 1800 Rommel started his advance. He finished his breakthrough through the defensive line at 2300 hours. Then moved towards Avenes while shooting up one French motorized infantry division and disturbing another one. At around 24 hours he reached Avenes, where a battle with the rest of the 1st armored division ensued until 4 o'clock in the morning. As you can see Rommel is already 10 kilometers behind enemy lines. Well I don't know if he ordered breakfast, but I guess not unless there was a drive-in since now Rommel decided to take advantage of the moment. He advanced through the rows of his confused opponents to Lanresis, 18 kilometers away, to take the important bridge over the Sambre river. Now during his breakthrough Rommel and Vanguard encountered several times French troops, which quite often were just paralyzed. 
Rommel sometimes drove towards them and requested them to drop their weapons, which they usually complied to. Finally, at 0600, Rommel took the bridge over the Samba in La Recise. He only stopped after he reached at 0630, the hills east of La Chateau. After all, the supplies and fuel and ammunition were already rather low, and he was out of radio contact to request further supplies. Yet that was only part of the problem. Only now does Rommel seem to notice that he only stood in La Chateau with the mass of his armored regiment and parts of a motorcycle company. Under the command of the command of the tank regiment, these forces were set up an all-around defense. Meanwhile, Rommel hurried back to bring the remainders of his division forward. As you can see, Rommel advanced around 40 to 35 kilometers behind the French lines, while bypassing and hitting various French divisions. But that was only one part of the story, because a large part of Rommel's division was actually still located where he left them the evening before. Namely, on the other side of the French defensive line. This included two motorized infantry regiments. So the question is, how did this happen? While well, at around 22.30 on the previous day, the Panzer Division was instructed by the Corps to attack on the following day. Yet Rommel's chief of staff could not reach him and was engaged in fighting on the extended parts of the Maginot Rhine already. Since the chief of staff followed the orders from the Corps headquarters, he held the position and prepared for an attack the next day. The order was to advance towards Avenes at 0800, which was taken by Rommel's about 8 hours earlier. As such, the division was fractured about an area of at least 50 kilometers length. Another problem was that although Robert penetrated the French defensive line, the gap within them was rather narrow, to quote from a German report. When we reached the Maginot line, we saw the following picture. An alley ran through the bunker line with its dense barrier belt. The pillboxes on both sides of the advanced road had been taken out by the tanks. The pillboxes further south were still completely intact. Through the thick and deep wire enclosure, an alley had just been blown up or cut to the width of a street. We would not believe that an entire division would be sluiced through a narrow alley. Meanwhile, at around 0700, so one hour before the rest of the division started to advance, Rommel backtracked along the way he took during the night, yet only with an 8-wheeled armored car and one Panzer III as an escort. Although the Panzer soon fell out due to technical problems. Note that according to another source, the 7th Panzer Division did not have any Panzer Threes at the beginning of the Battle of France. As such, I don't know if this Panzer Three was added to the division later on, or one or the other source has an error. As always, keep your grain of salt ready, ideally from the minds of your favorite Gnome Overlord. Anyway, according to Freezer, thus Rommel moved in a single armored car from the east to La Chateau to Avenes which was still enemy territory and clearly not free of French troops. The scenes described are sometimes quite ridiculous. If he ran into enemy resistance, he bypassed them. Yet several times Rommel convinced French units to surrender, likely thinking that they were actually caught behind enemy lines, not the other way around. According to Frise, he finally reached Avenes with captured French trucks trailing him, where he met with the leading elements of his remaining division. Well, so far about the general timeline of events. Yet now we have to put everything into perspective. Many people understandably point out Rommel's leadership capabilities and bravery, yet they seem quite often to ignore that he was a division commander and later a corps and army commander. Now with such a command comes responsibility, and risking one's life surely is brave, yet losing the commander during a battle can have terrible consequences for the operation. As such, there needs to be a balance between leading from the front and ensuring command capabilities by keeping the commander out of harm's way. This is probably more obvious if we consider this remark from the German military historian, who is also a colonel, Gerhard Groß, who notes, whereby especially Rommel was leading his division in the style of a company commander. Now to put this into perspective, a panzer company had an authorized strength of 19 for a medium and 22 panzers for a light company, and above 150 men whereas the 7th Panzer Division had an actual strength of 225 Panzers in May 1940, and likely around 10 to 13,000 men as personnel. As you can see, there's quite a bit of a gap, not to mention any issues with chain of command nor delegation here. This is also linked to the next point, although Rommel's bravery is undeniable, so is his luck. We should not forget that Rommel at one point was just moving with one armored car during daylight behind enemy lines and encountered several French units, some of which he convinced to surrender, others he evaded after encountering resistance. 
There are many issues here, taking major risk and losing radio contact to his own units. Although initially it's very doubtful that he lost the radio contact at all. Freezer pointed out that Rommel could only be reached by radio when he wanted to. In other words, he created a lot of problems for everyone involved, including himself. Of course, it is important to mention that the Battle of France of various forms of disregard for orders and seizing their initiative by German commanders, which in several cases was crucial for the decisive success of the campaign. Yet Rommel went a bit further and then beyond that. But Rommel was also distinguished by his almost unsurpassable arbitrary acts, which made him a troop leader who could practically not be led by his superiors. It should not be forgotten that Rommel, due to his closeness to Hitler, got command of the 7th Panzer Division. If Rommel would have been less successful and or not be friends with Hitler, he might have been in serious trouble. Remember, Guderian and others in winter 1941 were sacked for far less. And also had various issues during the Battle of France. One could argue that the French actually saved Rommel, although it is hard to tell because he might have acted quite differently if the French had acted in other ways. We need to keep in mind that during the Battle of France the initiative and offensive spirit of the German commanders was in stark contrast to that of the French. This allowed Rommel and other generals to act often with impunity. Although the following scene happened a few days after the described event, it gives an insight into the rather sluggish, sometimes even broken spirit of the French leadership during the Battle of France. General Ironside met on the 20th of May with General Gaston Bichot, commander of France's first army group. But the man Ironside encountered, a worn-out Segenarian too broken in spirit to take any initiative, left Ironside in a fury. His diary recounts what happened next. I lost my temper and shook Bichot by the button of his tunic. The man is completely beaten. Be aware that General Bichot should not be confused with the tank commander Captain Bichot, who shot up several panzers in stone. Additionally, it is important to note that some French commanders like General de Gaulle showed initiative during the Battle of France, yet with limited overall effect. Nevertheless, the results of Rommel's unauthorized push into French lines were quite staggering. The second French corps, which had been previously badly mauled in Belgium, basically routed in panic. Similarly, the remnants of the first French armor division were destroyed. Furthermore, Rommel's division inflicted various casualties on five other French divisions as well. On the 17th of May, about 10,000 French soldiers were captured in this section of the front. 3,500 of them fell into the hands of the 7th Panzer Division, although it had hardly any time for such measures during its hasty advance. The division's own losses on the 16th and 17th of May, on the other hand, amounted to only 40 dead and 75 wounded. As pointed out, Rommel's stash with his Ghost Division was both a major success, yet at the same time, in many ways, also a reckless move. In that way, the name Ghost Division can be seen in both a positive and in a negative light, as very well pointed out by the German military historian Karl-Heinz Frieser. The news that Rommel had disappeared without a trace with his tanks had caused great anxiety, thus the 7th Panzer Division had become a Ghost Division not only for the French, but also for the German general staff. Now I hope you have now a better understanding why the 7th Panzer Division was called Gespenster Division. And for completeness sake, it should be also noted that the 11th Panzer Division carried also the nickname Ghost Division. Yet this is something for another video. If you like well source content like this, consider supporting me on PayPal, Subscribestar or Patreon. Special thanks to Jack and Christian here for sending me books that were used yet not harmed during the making of this video. Sources are linked in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.